welcome to our discussion on the religious dimensions of Myanmar's protests. I'm Diane Moore, and I'm the faculty director of religion and public life at Harvard Divinity School, one of three co-sponsors of this event. My other two co-sponsors, our other two co-sponsors are um, the Asia Center at Harvard University and Harvard Law School's International Human Rights Clinic. I wanna welcome the over 200 members of the audience who are joining us this evening. Um, grateful to have you with us. Um, I especially wanna welcome and thank our panelists this evening, David Weiwei and Mu, who will be sharing their reflections about their insights and experiences. Um, I, like all of you, uh, have been watching what's been taking place in Myanmar, equally inspired and humbled by the protests and horrified by the brutality of the military attacks against unarmed democratic protesters. There's been a decent amount of coverage, uh, thankfully, about um, the events unfolding in Myanmar, but very little about the religious dimensions of what is unfolding there. And that's why I'm especially honored to co-sponsor and very eager for this evening's discussion. I wanna introduce the event's facilitator and organizer, my uh, friend and colleague, Susan Hayward, who's a visiting fellow with us here at the Religion and Public Life Program this year as well as an HDS alumna and a longtime friend. Susan's own scholarship and professional work focuses on the intersection of religion, violence, and peace. And she has both knowledge of and deep relationship with the community of peace builders and activists in Myanmar in particular, some of whom are with us this evening. And I'm gonna turn it over now to you, Susan. And thanks again to all of you for being with us and especially to our panelists. Thank you, Diane. And thanks to all of you who've joined us tonight and especially those of you who are joining us from Asia. Good morning and hello from yesterday. Um, as I open, I am going to share with all of you some images to illustrate the topic we will be discussing today. We'll return to discuss some of these particular images later on in the discussion. Those of you who have been to Myanmar can attest, it is a deeply religious place. Religious symbols, practices, sacred spaces, religious charity networks, they all play visible and fundamental roles in Myanmar's social, political, and economic life. Especially those Buddhist in this majority Buddhist country, but also Christian, Muslim, indigenous, Sikh, Hindu, and other traditions found in this extraordinarily diverse country. During the previous long military regime from 1962 to 2011, Religious networks often tended to the needs, both material and spiritual, of people who were suffering. And the relationship between religion and the nation state, in particular, the privileged place of Buddhism within the state and nation, has long been a source of tension and contestation between communities. Meanwhile, major political movements in Myanmar, from the anti-colonial movement, to the 1988 democratic uprising, and of course the 2007 Saffron Revolution led by Buddhist monks and nuns have all had fairly significant religious dimensions to them. The current democratic protests, which erupted immediately following the February 1st seizure of power by the military, are not led by, re by religious figures, but by young people, mostly lay. And the response of high level religious authorities to the protest have, ex have illustrated what historian Scott Appleby refers to as the ambivalence of the sacred, the tendency for religious actors and ideas to respond ambivalently to violence. As we'll learn, some have supported the coup or have sought to remain neutral in the midst of the conflict that's taking place. 
while some have actively resisted the coup and the military by participating in the protests. And we're seeing some of the images of that. But nevertheless, religious ideas, religious symbols, institutions, actors, they've all played a role in the protests themselves, drawn on by activists, often in very creative ways, in order to empower the protests with a certain sacred power, to uh, imbue a sense of cultural and moral resonance within the protests, and to embrace a national vision of religious pluralism that is celebrated and that is the goal of the, the federal democracy that the protests are mobilizing on behalf of. So we have three activists who currently reside outside Myanmar who are here to explore these themes with us today. David Mo is a Christian from Chin State and a PhD candidate in theology at Asbury Theological Seminary. Weiwei Nu is a Rohingya activist currently based in DC running the Women's Peace Network. And Sambun Chung Rampi, who goes by the nickname Mu, is joining us from Bangkok, where he leads the International Network of Engaged Buddhists. But before they speak, I have a, a bit of a surprise tonight, which is that we're gonna begin with a video presentation that was sent to us by two more Burmese activists. These are both Buddhists. One is a Bamar who is based in Yangon, who prefers to remain anonymous. And another is a Shan Buddhist who's based in Sri Lanka, a woman named Nanglung Hom, whose voice you'll hear in the video. Given our short time frame, I unfortunately cannot show the video in its entirety, but I will show three clips. And, and after that, we will then hear from, from David Weiwei and Mu and have a facilitated discussion. We do hope to have time at the very end to answer one or two questions from the audience. And so we invite you to submit your questions in the Q&A window down at the bottom at any time. Um, some of them we'll be able to respond to in writing as we go. Other audience members have the ability to vote on the questions that they also want to have answered. And so we'll try to, um, with, if time permits, to answer one or two that seem most, most popular at the bottom. We'll also leave the chat window open so you can continue to introduce yourself and where you're calling from. If you haven't already, we just ask that everybody please be respectful in, um, in your chats. And finally, before we begin, I want to take a moment to honor those in Myanmar, um, also known as Burma, who are courageously protesting against the brutal military armed only with their conviction. Much of what we will share today, we know thanks to their courage in sharing images and stories from the front lines, despite the risk in being there and in sharing those stories on, on social media. And I want to honor especially the 60 plus protesters who we know have been killed by sharing some lines of poetry written by one of those fallen heroes, Keza Win, as translated by Coco Thet. Keza Win wrote this poem, which is entitled Letter from a Jail Cell, while imprisoned several years ago after participating in educational reform protests. A thief is unarmed, a thug, is armed to the teeth. If thieves are ungovernable, if thugs are ungovernable, what's the point of government? Whatever happens to the jungles, whatever happens to the mountains, whatever happens to the rivers, they don't care. They love the country just the way they love to grate a coconut from inside out for coconut milk. Plinth by plinth to make their throne taller, they will point their guns at the urna on the Lord Buddha's forehead. Their class is that crass. To cuss at that class, if your religion forbids you, allow me to lose that religion. I will turn the air blue on your behalf. May the memory of Keza Win and his words and the memory of all those who've fallen inspire us in our collective work for love and justice. And with that, let me now share the video remarks sent to us from our two Burmese Buddhist friends. I would like to start with how Buddhist monks and nuns are responding to the protests. 
we can categorize the responses of Buddhist monks and nuns in three different categories. The first group are those who strongly support military coup. In addition, they also criticize and disturb the protest and civilian movement. Majority of them are the supporter of military USDP and nationalist activity. Some monks who involved in 2007 Saffron revolutions are also participated in supporting military coup. Although many monks actively participate with civilian in 1988 and 2007 revolution, some of them, including senior monks, disagree with the secular political approach of NLD government. They believe Buddhism and Buddhist clergy are entitled to have special privilege. They want to be treated specially superiority and way above the other religious clergy. The second group of Buddhist monks and nuns are those who neither show their support to military coup nor agree with civilian protests against the coup. They are the largest populations of Buddhist clergy. This category of monks and nuns perceive whoever come to power, they are to accept the new government as well as their donations and support. They are fear that there will be more dangers and bad consequences happen to them if they show their agreement with any political party or show solidarity with people. Some of the clergy in this group simply don't want to mix with religion and politics. They prefer to focus only on religious ritual and duty. The third group of Buddhist monks and nuns are those who show strong condemnations on military coups and actively participate in civilian protests. The majority of monks and nuns in this group are younger generation who are educated in both Buddhist literature and modern education. In this group, there are very limited participation of influential and senior monks. The monks and nuns in this group against military coup, violent crackdown and military dictatorship with strong, courageous and clear voice. They are the key player behind the monks organization and Buddhist institution, which issue many statements to condemn military coups and acts of violence against civilians. Next, I would like to highlight on how military use Buddhism to legitimate its action. Right after the declaration of the NLD winning over USDP, the chief military council visited two powerful and influential leading monks from various parts of Myanmar. The picture of their donation and visit were uploaded on USDP Facebook. Right after February 1st military coup, Senior General Mi Aulai went for arms donation at the famous and big monastery in Mandalay. He went to pay homage to Sirigu Searo in Sakai and instruct Mandalay Division Military Council to visit State Sangha Council Chairman Bamo Searo. They also invited religious leaders from different religions for a meeting to show their roles of religious leader in the military council. At the same time, the houses of worship, which were closed during pandemic, were forced to reopen. They strictly ordered to hold the national Buddhist examination for monks and nuns. However, some senior monks resist to hold the Buddhist examination. Now they are urgently prepared for a big supreme award-giving ceremony which related to religion and sasana. They forcefully held this examination and organized high-level ceremony in order to show the country's stability and prosperity after they take over the power. They aim to gain more credibility and trust by showing their support to religious prosperity. Here I would like to share more on Buddhist ideas are being used to guide protesters. Many people are clear on the situation as competition between Dhamma and Adama, which is jestic and ingesting. People make clear that 
this is revolution of truth and this is revolution against injustice and unlawful act by military dictator. The strength of unity is essential in this revolution of truth, justice and freedom. We people also understood and predict the wars that military will use weapon and all sort of violence with their greed and hunger of power. Even though it has been over a month long protest, people are holding the same level of hope, unity, strength and confidence on against military dictatorship in all sort of peaceful means. Majority in Myanmar, we grown up with high authoritarian culture, questioning to the high position monks, religious leader, teachers, and elder are discouraged, prohibited, and even sometimes would get punished. Older generations and those in position are more knowledgeable, wiser, so that they are to guide and to lead. This is the common belief. However, during spring revolution, younger generation are courageously questioning to the senior monks and those who are in power. Younger generation take on leadership role at the front line with a humble and respectful support from older generation from behind. We can also witness the culture of mutual respect, learning from each other, co-creation among generation becomes strengthening. This beautifully reflect on the Buddha teaching of Mingala Sutta, the reverent and humility culture in social relation. In bigger picture, from the unity and solidarity among people during this spring revolution, we could collectively challenge nationalism, Buddhist radicalization, and Brahmanization, which are deeply rooted in our society. In this spring revolution, regardless of differences in gender, religion, ethnicity, social status, political party, and age, we come together in one platform with one common mission, which is to take down military dictatorship and build democratic federal unions. Thank you very much. And with that, we'll now turn to our speakers who join us, beginning with uh, David. And then after we'll hear from Weiwei and then Mu, and then we'll re I'll return for a facilitated discussion. So David, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan, for your kind introductions and uh, for inviting us to be part of this panel. Um, today, I would like to share with you about three different groups of Christians, those who respond to the military government. Myanmar has been a military government since 1962. Leaving with that context, there are three different groups of Christians in Myanmar. The first group is what I will call politicians Christians. They are involved in the politics as uh, politicians. And some of them are the, uh, the ethnic rebels because uh, when the military emerged in 1962, some ethnic rebels came out with their weapons to uh, fight against this uh, military government. The first group is involved in a politics uh, with their calling, with their uh, convictions. Those are the politician Christians. And the second group uh, is uh, a, a political Christians, I'll call them. Uh, these Christians are theologically, they are conservative, or we will say, they are fundamentalists. They don't want to be involved in politics, even though politics is involved in their life. They want to stay away from politics. And uh, they feel that their calling, their ministry is not to be in politics. And also this uh, group of Christians looking forward to this other world issue rather than this uh, world issue. Uh, some people might say that, um, uh, uh, Involving in politics is this is a liberal. This is uh, nothing to to do with our Christian faith. So the second group trying to stay away uh, from politics, and the third group is what I would call prophetic Christians. These Christians are bigger than the first and the second group, in my view. Uh, in this group, there are a number of intellectual Christians, pastors, and there are some lay Christians. Uh, they feel that resisting the military government and injustice 
issue is part of what prophets in the Old Testament are doing. So the third group, uh, theologically, they are more liberal and uh, prophetically, they are resistance against uh, military government. So along with the first group and this third group, we can see there are different ways of uh, protesting against the military government uh, recently. Uh, even though they have one faith, one Christian faith, but the way they respond to these military governments are different from one another. It's not just one form of protest. Uh, some people, uh, some Christians are more vocal. Uh, they go to the uh, street to demonstrate against the military government. But some people still are trying to remain invisible or maybe less vocal, partly because uh, they fear the military government because you know demonstrating in, in Myanmar is not like here in the US. Here in the US, if you go to the street, you can freely demonstrate, you have peace. But demonstrating in Myanmar is we have to fight against the people with the weapons. So that is life and death. We, we're not sure that whether we'll come back alive. Um, so some people trying to stay away, uh, I mean, trying to stay uh, invisible or less vocal in terms of their protest. Although they don't go to the strike to demonstrate against the military government, they try to go to church or they try to go to the church buildings to pray for this uh, country. And what we can also see from this demonstration is um, we can see uh, two examples here. Um, in, the, in the northern part of Kachin, uh, there is uh, uh, the Catholic nuns, those who go out to the street and bleed it with the, um, with the, with the armed forces, not to kill any uh, protesters. Kind of like they are embodying Jesus Christ as a peacemaker. They want to back the police, not to kill any uh, peaceful uh, protesters. And another way of demonstrating to, uh, against this uh, government is uh, ZDM movement. Uh, many people, not just Christians in Myanmar, but uh, different religious groups feel that this ZDM movement is uh, effective. And so some Christians in our regions uh, stop going to the offices and stop working you know, in the, in the in the society. So this kind of uh, uh, protesting against the government is also very uh, helpful among these Christians in our regions. And some people somehow um, uh, uh, withdraw their work. So they need some, uh, some money and things like that. So among Christians, we raise some funds to support uh, these people. Uh, let me clarify what do I mean by CDM? That's a short term, sorry. Uh, CDM means civil disobedience movement. This is a very nonviolent way of protesting against the government. If we make this CDM movement effective, we feel that the government cannot run their government. So um, that's, that, that is what we're really hoping for. And uh, there are many, many people among Christians who are involved in the CDM movement. And we really support this movement. And in terms of financial needs, we raise some funds among here. And so we, we really support this movement. And lastly, what I can also see here is, um, so now there are a number of uh, uh, Christian communities, not only in Myanmar, but also in, 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 in other countries. So we feel that the internal way of demonstrating against government is not enough, but you know, living here in the US or in, in, in other parts of the world, we are trying to demonstrate against this the government and making this uh, demonstration a way of our international community. So we really feel that. So our international community, uh, people will also join in this demonstration and are making um, our voice uh, heard among their own community. So this is all what I can say and we'll have more discussions later. So thank you so much. Thank you, David and Weiwei, we would love to hear from you now. Thank you, thank you, Suzanne, and thank you, um, Apil, for having us here. It's an honor to join this discussion. Um, so, when it comes to Muslim, um, just to give you a brief, um, I guess, overview of, of background, the uh, I guess um, we don't have a specific uh, stat statistic. Uh, like exact statistics on the the um, number of Muslims in Myanmar, 
but um, many of us um, estimate that it might be, I mean, government said it's full percents of the populations, but we think it's larger than that. It might be four to seven percents of the uh, Burmese, uh, of the populations in Myanmar among 55 million people. And um, among this Muslim group, uh, one of the largest Muslim group is the Rohingya populations themselves. We were about one to two million, uh, but now we only have 600,000 left in Myanmar, uh, in Rakhine state, and then a couple of hundred thousands outside of Rakhine state uh, live in different cities. Uh, so that's somehow demography of the uh, Muslim populations in, in Myanmar. And uh, among, uh, apart from the Muslim Rohingya, among other groups, other uh, uh, in um, the rest of the Muslim populations are uh, very, very diverse. Uh, we have many ethnic groups from many different backgrounds. Um, some are converts or some of Burmese national, uh, you know, traditionally believe in Islam for many, many years, for centuries. Some are uh, Muslim tribes from uh, China, some are Muslim tribes from uh, Malaysia, and a lot, many of them, especially those live in, um, in city like Yango, uh, a lot of them backgrounds are from uh, perhaps from many India or Pakistan, um, the, the descendant of those, uh, uh, those who were brought uh, or came along uh, during, the, during the colonial period for, to serve the country, uh, Myanmar, under the British uh, uh, king uh, for, for a long time ago. So this is really a diverse group of Muslim populations in Myanmar. And um, so people have different culture, different, uh, I guess, uh, uh, languages um, and uh, belief and political views. Uh, but when it's come to the uh, political movement, um, I guess, um, you know, it is hard to say what is exactly here. What I'm saying is that's my understanding and my perceptions, I guess. Um, so uh, what we have seen so far is uh, that, um, yeah, in this protest, Muslims are actively involved. A lot of them are, while many of them also stay behind. Uh, and uh, stay not neutral, but you know, like being cautious. Um, this protest is a little unique. I will go to that a deeper a little bit uh, later on. But I also wanted to recall that the Muslims' participations in Myanmar politics has been all the way long back to democ uh, uh, the the independence movement to all other protests and. And, and political processes in, in Myanmar. So uh, during the 1988 uh, revolutions, there were many Muslim groups came out with the Islamic symbol um, and character to show that Muslims themselves support the protests. Um, and also, you know, uh, I'm sure there will be some, uh, uh, there will be Muslim participations in the 2007 as well. I don't know detail. I can't recall, I was in the prison. Um, so I, I don't have the evidence now, but I seen here and there some photos from some of my colleagues from um, in 2007 revolutions. So what I'm uh, trying to say is Muslim participations in this kind of major events and revolutions in Myanmar is not new. It's been there. But this time people are being a bit more careful. However, after a few days of uh, the uh, military coup, uh, the Islamic Council of Myanmar, which include four major Islamic bodies, they released a statement denouncing the military coup. At the same time when um, the, the protest has started, the Muslim actually, uh, a lot of Muslims joined the protest, but sometimes they would show their characteristic of like, I guess, you know, the Muslim style of wearing or uh, flex or symbol, there are a, 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 a lot of them came out with the Muslim symbol, but many Muslims in Myanmar, you know, do not necessarily show 
a lot of the Muslims characteristic, just like me, they might not wear a scarf or, um, you know, they might not have beer, beer uh, like, you know, other, other as, you know, other would characterize as those as Muslim. Um, so, so like that, right, a lot of Muslim youth involved, as I know, uh, including Rohingya youth, uh, but they wouldn't, they would not necessarily characterize as Muslim. But on the other hand, there are groups that imams groups and other groups like interfaith groups come and came out together to show their religion, um, to, to, to denounce, uh, you know, to to denounce the military coup publicly. So that is a one trend like that. On the other hand, a lot of them mingle or integrated to the movement as individual, as a citizens. Um, so uh, I guess um, in, in other words, a lot of the Muslims who participate in this protest feel um, you know, uh, responsible to respond to the, to the crisis right now. And um, the regard, and they know, you know, the the re, the there will be some acknowledgement, or they may even face uh, backfire or backlash for participating in these uh, conditions because Muslim has been uh, traditionally, as you know, highly marginalized and and hated by the majority populations in Myanmar. Uh, however. Uh, we have seen some uh, sympathy and some support for the Muslims' uh, participations in Myanmar uh, in, in the protests on the social media. Uh, there has been a few Muslims who died uh, over the past two weeks. Um, and one of them was uh, a few days ago, um, um, a member of NLD uh, in, in, in uh, downtown Yangon in Lata, uh, in, in Lemedo. Um, so he has been killed uh, uh, within a night of uh, his arrest. And uh, there has been some Muslim killed in, um, in, in Molimnyain. And um, one uh, particular young man, uh, 19 years old, he was uh, killed, oh, he was shot dead. Um, and one interesting thing came out is that his identity card. So his identity card is a naturalized citizenship card, which is a second class citizenship card in Myanmar, unlike in the United States or elsewhere. So, so this, uh, the, 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 this interesting factor that somehow raised awareness among the public, he gave life for the people, for the, for the protest, for the freedom, but he was not regarded as a full citizen of the of the of the of the country, so a lot of people started to realize how they have been marginalized and ignoring or discriminating the the Muslim populations in general. So I think that is, I mean, it, it is tragic that we lost people, but on the other hand, we are also seeing some uh, support and some acknowledgement of the treatment towards Muslim populations, but. Uh, Based on my experience, uh, you know, I feel like I hope that this will last. I hope that the solidarity and understanding, public awareness, um, the, the 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 realizations that the common enemy is the military will last even after. Uh, let's say we gain freedom again. We gain democracy. We restore democracy, even. Uh, until then, uh, based on my experience, I'm not very confident to say that. I've seen Burmese uh, community is very easy to manipulate by the propaganda. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a bit of hopeful at the same time, I'm a bit uh, cautious and worried. Um, let's say being cautious. Uh, yeah, a lot of Muslims actually are being cautious and trying to stay behind and supporting from the back, uh, supporting protesters and CDM movement from the back in by many means, not only just showing up in front of the, uh, in the protest, but also providing financial support, material support. Uh, you know, I've seen a, a lady providing food. Um, so many forms of support has been there. One thing very interesting for the Muslims in Myanmar is that I don't think there has, I have seen any support for them, for the military coup, the military's um, uh, dictatorship at all. So that is very unique. And I think that is very interesting. And I hope that Burmese community will start to realize 
course, uh, you know, the, the way Muslim has always been stood uh, for the country and stand, continue to stand for and build this uh, towards a more, uh, you know, inclusive and fair country, uh, you know, build this like, uh, the, 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 the situations will lead to, to, to such a country that we need, uh, we envision for, for a long time. I'm going to end here and I will be happy to uh, take all the questions and answer you may have later on. Thank you, Weiwei. And Mu, if you could speak to us about the transnational Buddhist support. Thank you, Susan. And good morning from Bangkok. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, introduce about International Network of Engaged Buddhists. We are the uh, international network of the Buddhist activists around the world uh, established in late 80s. During 80s in Thailand, that is uh, their number of the, you know, uh, refugees, you know, either from Cambodia and Myanmar, is Burma, that came to Thailand. And from that side, we, we support, for example, the, the Cambodians after the 1991 uh, peace agreement, we helped to organize the peace walk, Damayatra, for the refugee to return to Cambodia. And then after the 1988, the student uprising, there are a number of them came to the Thai border. We also helped to support the Jungle University for the student at the border. And then in uh, mid 90s, we start to get uh, involved inside Burma and also to start our work with the Kachin people, the Kachin Baptists. And then we start, they're asking us to help to train the new generation of their leaders. And from that, we start to involve to different ethnic groups and also religious group to work to, to train the leadership for, for Burma. Uh, we start with the, you know, the Baptist, and then we work with the Catholic, with the Anglican Church, with the Buddhist, and with the Muslim communities. And from that, until now, we have over a thousand alumni in Burma that start to organize different uh, activities and set up different civil society group, the NGO, and so on. And also we have the training on the peace leadership, leadership training, also on the nonviolence, you know, mindful mediation and so on and so forth. And that also that influence inside the Burma as well. Uh, as you know, Thailand also, we have the protests every day, you know, with the youth, the young movement. And that also is uh, because Thailand also running by the military government also. In last August and September, when this uh, uprising, you know, in Thailand, I also helped to organize to have a Zoom link to the activist friends and also student groups in Myanmar to share experience with the between the youth in Thailand and also Myanmar. That also we have many times of Zooms sharing, and that also they learn from each other. And also, you know, part of that also, this is linked up with the multi alliance, you know, in the broader, you know, movement in Asia, which is Hong Kong, Taiwan, Thailand, Myanmar, that kind of link that we have been connected. Since the coup uh, took place, uh, INEP, International Network of Engaged Buddhists, we issued a statement to, you know, uh, demand for this the, the for the transition change and especially focus on the nonviolence means and also to have the inclusive dialogue process. And another aspect that we would like to say that is also all the leaders, whether Aung San Suu Kyi or Min Aung Lai also they need to have the reflective space that they should reflect on themselves as a individual as a personal as well, because a lot of things come from the, you know, the personal aspect. 
right? For example, even the uh, Aung San Suu Kyi also need to reflect on the Rohingya issues, as well as the ethnic city, uh, ethnic city issues, how that can lead into the federal democracy. For Thailand, we since the coup start, now we set up the FAD, Friends Against Dictatorship, that also to help to support the CDM from Thailand side, what we can do to support them. At the same time also, we also educate the Thai people, Thai in public also, to understand the context of Burma, what the situation, as well as even the some issue that need to be introduced. And also we did the campaign, like we link up with the uh, Burmese migrant workers in Thailand, also to, do, to voice out from the Thailand side, even support the students from Myanmar who are threatened by the uh, immigrant, those, 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 the immigration office, officer in Thailand also, we are trying to stop doing a, a, a law's lawyer to support them. This kind of thing that we are helping from the Thailand side, that is uh, to our friends in the movement in Myanmar. Thank you for now. Thank you to all three of you. And if you could all uh, turn on your videos and join me, I have a few follow-up questions for you, but I'm just really struck by a, a couple things off the bat. Um, the first being the extraordinary transnational networks that the religious communities have. So whether it's Christians or, or Muslims in diaspora um, who are showing solidarity, putting political pressure in their own home countries, sending material support, or the, the transnational links through different organizations that are involved in, in peace building, including through the engaged Buddhist networks. And the way, of course, that, uh, that also reflects the, the Milk Tea Alliance, some of the, the alliances that have formed between various democratic movements uh, across Asia, but the distinctive ways in which religious networks across um, across countries, across regions, across the world can serve as a funnel or a vehicle for providing support to those on the ground. Um, but secondly, reflected as well in the video remarks that were sent um, by Nang Long Hom, the, the fact that there's, there's different ways in which religious actors are responding. Some of them choose not to participate in the protests, either because of a sense of vulnerability or as a spiritual value that to be involved in politics is, is not appropriate for a spiritual leader. Um, and that some participate very much as a reflection of their spiritual commitments or an understanding of their spiritual roles. So I have a question for, for each of you. David, I'll, I'll start with you. I wonder if you could reflect briefly on how these protests are different from those in 1988 and 2007 and how those differences, what they might say about the ways in which this, this protest movement might be able to finally address some of the forms of cultural and structural violence that many um, ethnic and religious minority communities have faced. Yes, thank you, Susan. That is a great question. Um, yes, completely different from the, the previous two uh, uh, movements, uh, like in 1988, that movement was led mainly by the university students. And later on, of course, more people joined, but not many Christians might have been joined in that protest. And again, in 2007, that movement was led by the Buddhist monks. That's why we call it suffering revolutions, right? So Christians were um, silent in that two movements. Um, and of course, at least they were not actively uh, involved in the in the protests in the revolutions. But in this movement, yes, absolutely, many many uh, Christians uh, involved in these uh, 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 protests, um, uh, especially the young people. Uh, uh, the young people are more active in these protests, partly because uh, some of them. Uh, have voted for the NLD this past November, that might be their first vote ever in their life because, you know, Myanmar has been a military country for many, many years. They did not have a chance to vote. So this young generation had a chance to vote for NLD. Of course, this is not just between the NLD and the USDP government. Uh, some people still might feel in that way, but now we feel that this is just a movement for everyone. So they feel that this is just not just a partisan politics. This is just a national politics. 
So they feel that this was their first time to vote for an LV and they really love democracy. So in that sense, more Christians inclusively they're involved in this, uh, in this reason uh, protest. So completely different from the previous two. And one thing I also like to highlight why a little bit older generations don't want to be involved. There might be several reasons. One reason might be they fear because you know demonstrating against the military government is not easy, not like here in the US, they have weapons, they have to kill us. And second, these older generations might get used to living under the military government for many years. They get used to it. But this younger generation, this is something new and for them, instead of living under the military government, it's better to die as the result of protest. So it's kind of like really inc like they have this brave spirit in their in their uh, in their protest. So some of their parents, I I I, I talked to some of our Christians, uh, those who are involved in this uh, uh, protest. Some of their parents are also not allowed. Uh, they don't allow their their children to go to the street actually because because of you know uh, vulnerability because of their risk. So, but some younger Christians, they're really involved in this protest, going to the, to the, to the strike and protest against this uh, government. So what I can say is completely different from the previous two movement, and this is more inclusive among Christian community. Yeah, so it seems that the process of the protest in, in ensuring inclusivity also is a reflection of the goal that they're seeking. And as Wei Wei yes. said, we, we hope and we pray that that kind of inclusivity continues. Um, into the future. Wei Wei, uh, a question for you. You are the head of the Women's Peace Network and I know you participated and you follow the role of women in particular in, in activism and in this protest movement. There was over the past few days, the, um, the women's laundry or the Damain um, tactic that was being used. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that, but also the idea of spiritual power or POM that, that was being critiqued as, as a part of that protest movement. Um, sure. So uh, it's been astonishing to see how the Tamein revolution, as we call it, uh, has been um, very popular among the public um, against the military coup. Yes, uh, traditionally women's clothing, lower uh, clothing of uh, uh, women lower body, has been seen as um, um, uh, culturally and spiritually seen as dirty, and thus. Um, if uh, you know, uh, if if men, um, if the women's clothing is put on uh, uh, on top of the like uh, above the man man head or you know on, in, on their body, it seems as weakening their uh, their masculine uh, power upon, and it's it's bring it's also believe that it's bring bad luck to the. To the male, uh, to 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 the man. So it has a very strong belief uh, uh, in, in lies in there. And now, uh, I mean, whether that belief is right or not, I'm not here to argue. But it seems like um, that has been widely practiced across the uh, religion and 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 cultures and and ethnic groups in Myanmar, uh, as far as I know. And um, and now women have find this uh, to use against this masculine uh, traditional belief against the very uh, patriarchal uh, military institution, masculine patriarchal military institution uh, itself. So, uh, so yeah, one thing it's working because military immediately issued uh, order order saying that those who hang or wave the women tamain or longchi or sarong uh, outside of their house or on the street will be punished by the emergency law uh, 576 section d uh, so clearly it is working they are terrified to see women uh, uh, longchi hanging everywhere in uh, uh, where the protests are happening. And uh, we have also seen photos of uh, police, uh, you know, go, uh, going up there, taking down the Tamein. Um, and all of these things are coming out and it's been really, really interesting to see and really feel like women's become, women's feel very empowered to see the, uh, uh, the these, um, 
uh, empowered to, uh, to in a way that their 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 coating has been always been like you know put as like dirty regarded as dirty and suppressed in a way morally suppressed women are right by these traditionals or uh spiritual uh practices and belief and men's obtain so much power um uh, for, through this uh, beliefs right so now they feel like you know by by um uh, resisting them the military by descending military by by uh, with their own um uh, tamane or you know underwear that has that is presumably dirty and 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 ter like terror terrorizing the military institutions has been very very empowering for the women to feel and to see and also you know as i said it's very interesting to see that majority Burmese populations are supporting it. Otherwise they wouldn't, uh, you know, they would, women will be subjected to, uh, you know, um, a threat to the cultural religions otherwise. But now because of the military, there has been, we're seeing uh, the, the uh, solidarity for the women and support for this movement as well. So, you know, for a lot of young women uh, and young youth uh, in Myanmar, the fight is not just about, uh, you know, the, the fight against the military uh, institu institutions or military dictatorship. Uh, the fight is not just about the restorations of NLD's power. It is actually the, the fight against the uh, anti-democratic elements, anti um, like uh, sexism, uh, patriarchy, and racism. All of this younger progressive male and women, a uh, male and, uh, and and female, they are they are looking for a even broader. Uh, uh, having broader visions and broader, broader goal than restorations of uh, the Aung San Suu Kyi's and NLD powers, or then just merely uh, a, a, a fight against the current coup. It's about the fight against all of this militarism, military systems, uh, which has been deep, strong and deep rooted into our politics, as well as other form of, um, I guess, dictatorship, other form of repressions, uh, such as uh, uh, patriarchy and, and racism. Wonderful, thank you. It's it's a powerful movement trying to transform not just a political system, but but cultural and social and many other kinds of systems that have reinforced forms of domination. Mu, I'm going to challenge you. I have uh, two questions that I want to ask you. And we have very little time, so I'm going to ask you to try to answer them as succinctly as you can. Um, and that is that I notice as an observer that there seems to be far more um, monastic participation of Buddhist monks and nuns in the protests in Burma than in Thailand. And I wonder if you think that's the case and if so, why? And also there's been a lot of participation of LGBT communities in both Thailand and in Burma in the protests. And if there's any reflections you have about how um, religious Buddhist actors uh, and authorities have been responding to the participation or the visibility of LGBT groups. Well, uh... The monks in Thailand is more conservative and less pol political involvement. One from the history historical background that also because Thailand never been colonized, but Burma and Sri Lanka being colonized, and that's they using the religious power, religious force to against the 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 colonizations. That kind of thing also is being situate into their culture, into their Buddhist movement also. But Thailand didn't have that kind of aspect. Thailand is very much uh, the monk being patronized by the monarch or by the government and so on and so forth. That kind of thing, they are just floating with their, you know, uh, luxurious life, that's thing. And regarding to the LGBT, I think it's, uh, it's very, is is really good whether the, the the protests in Thailand or Myanmar bring different groups to voice out, you know, and also Burma is more conservative in term regarding to the LGBT. Thailand is more liberal, you know, even though we didn't have the law to for the same sex marriage, 
But last year, you know, in February, I invited a pikuni, a, a, a female monk from Taiwan, Venerable Chao Wei, to Burma, to Yangon, and also we have the, the public talk in Yangon to share her experience because her experience are quite inspired to the LGBT rights group in Taiwan. And from that, they can move into the legalize the same sex marriage, which is the first country in Asia that to legalize this. I think that also in the future also, you know, the, the, uh, the group like a CDM and so on, so should connect more into the different experiences in the region as well. Even, you know, how that can connect to the far, uh, farmers movement in India that is, uh, you know, is growing, that kind of thing. I think we should connect more and also that to work through this. That's why we set up our group Friends, Friends Against Dictatorship, that kind of thing. We need to work hand in hand in our region. Yeah, this is clearly a big need and it's inspiring to see the kinds of transnational connections that are being made already because we know the forces of authoritarianism are also forging those kinds of transnational ties, the Sri Lankan and the Myanmar military and, and so on. So these kinds of uh, networks for, for in support of justice and support of peace and to share creative ideas. We're seeing examples of that and more of it will, will only serve the cause better. So as we leave, I want to give an opportunity to all three of you, but not an obligation to say one final word of hope about some of the religiously informed paths to support the protests and the goal. Does anybody want to answer that question as a final word? And please just keep it in one line if you can. <laughs> I hope. I, I'll try. Um, so one hope uh, final hope uh, that I could say is uh, is that there has been increasing like uh, acknowledgement and realizations of the uh, the violations uh, against the Rohingya populations. So there, uh, you will see uh, many Burmese people, like especially the younger generation, not from any leaders though, but from the younger prote protesters and general people, say, saying we're sorry you know, that we didn't stood up for the Rohingya. So that has been very, very moving, very uh, uh, hopeful and, and uh, very heartwarming. I hope the leaders uh, in the country started to realize that too, and started to realize the Rohingya's fundamental rights as people of Myanmar and help bring us justice for the crimes of genocides and crimes against humanity. So that, 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 that is one thing that I want to uh, say. David, anything you wanted to add? Uh, yeah. uh, oh, not, not that much, uh, but someone put uh, something about it is the LPH, is it something that we could share or? Yeah, if you could just say in one line, since we're a minute uh, over already, just what the CRPH is, maybe okay. what your hopes uh, are. Yeah, well, yeah, what we really hope is the success of the CLPH. Um, uh, CLPH simply means that is the new uh, government organization represented by the, the elected uh, Democratic Party. Uh, we really want the international community to recognize this one, this organization, so, so that this can exist to fight against this the unelected military government. So this new organization could represent this the civilian people. Because we really hope that this will be successful. But again, we really want international community to recognize these organizations. Thank you. Great, thank you. Lou, is there anything you would like to say as a final word? We need to develop more spiritual friendships beyond religious, religions beyond ethnic cities. And also, Min Ong Lai and Ong San Suu Kyi should practice deep listening. Yes. Thank you to all three of you 
thank you to all of you who joined us tonight. There is so much more that we could say. This is such a complex topic and all of us are very passionate about it. So um, I hope that this conversation will continue, that we'll have more opportunities to, to reflect and to share on this. Um, but for tonight or for this morning, for those of you in Asia, we will end now so that you can go on with your day and uh, with great gratitude for, for the contributions of all of our activists, both in words today, but for what you're doing on the ground to support the cause of justice and, and peace. We thank you. It reflects the best of our religious traditions and compelling people to do extraordinary self-sacrificial things for the cause of the other and to reduce suffering. So again, thank you to everybody. Thanks to all of our co-sponsors and um, please stay in touch and, and keep following the events that are being offered by the Religion and Public Life Program at Harvard Divinity School. Have a good night.